All right, so um, a huge thing to talk about and, and probably don't give it enough time here is the arts and crafts movement. Um, this is this is a movement that evolves in the late 19th century as a counterpoint to the industrial revolution it's not just an architectural movement it's a movement of arts and culture it's also a a philosophical cultural movement that responds to the massive changes that occur to people's lives from the industrial revolution and i love this quote by albert hubbard who we'll be talking about. Uh, art is the expression of man's joy in his work. And um, the, the Industrial Revolution, many people thought, was a, a movement and a cultural shift that took away people's joy and humanity. You know, we started to see people working in factories, you know, long, long hours, much longer than people work today. There was no eight hour workday, you know, in, in the early, um, in the 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, so people worked six days a week, you know, 12 hour days, you know, the drudgery of, of being in a factory, of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, there was no, you know, you know, labor rights and so forth. Um, there was massive pollution. People were living in you know, nasty tenements in cities um, that were crowded and, and disease ridden. And, you know, it's just, you know, people started to romanticize uh, a different way of life before that, you know, of living on farms and working the land and being, you know, immersed in nature and not, you know, buried in these dirty, crowded, stinky cities. And to a certain extent, it was a romanticized view because life was very hard in medieval era when people worked the land. You know, you, you, you know, if your crop failed, you starved. Um, if you know there there was plenty of disease, you know, the plagues and so forth in in the medieval era as well that people died from. So it certainly was a romanticized view of a of a just a different time, a better time. And we still see that today. Um, you know, people. People have a hard time with change, right? And you know the massive technological changes of the computer revolution that we are living in right now. Um, I grew up in it. You grew up in it. You know, even more so. Um, that is hard for some people to embrace, and they think about a, a simpler day. You know, when computers didn't control all of our lives. The same philosophies people had back then, when when factories and you know workdays. Um, and the drudgery and tenements didn't, you know, run our lives. And so this is this is a massive cultural shift count to that. And um, you know, there's this feeling that we've become over over consumption. That we're just buying things because they're cheap and because we can. We don't value things that we own anymore. Um, because you can just order something from a catalog that's made in a factory and it's cheap, and if it breaks, you just buy a new one. And all of these things. Um, are, are kind of what goes into the arts and crafts movement. And it starts around 1850, especially in England, which was the first to fully embrace the Industrial Revolution. And it, it spreads throughout Europe and it spreads across the pond to America uh, by the late 19th century as well. So um, really, most people consider the founder of this movement to be John Ruskin. Uh, he, was in, he, he was English. Um, and, you know, he, he came of age during the Industrial Revolution in England. We talked, you know, when we talked about that. Uh, and, you know, he, he really lamented. He was one of those who didn't take the change so nicely. And he lamented all of the cultural changes that were occurring. And he also had a Christian fundamentalist philosophy as well that had its early roots. The early roots of the arts and crafts movement um, also had a sort of a spiritual Christian connection too. That later would largely disappear, um, but it, it certainly was um, a, a part of the early movement. And so he wrote a book called The Seven Lamps of Architecture in 1849. And this is kind of what launches the arts and crafts movement. And his seven lamps are, are things, uh, sacrifice and truth, power, beauty, life, memory, obedience. You know, things that he felt were lost or being lost from this industrial revolution and this new way of life and new way of living. 
and people were getting or losing this. And you can read some of the other aspects of, of what he believes, you know, people ought to gain back. Um, and, and he really looked at the medieval era, and you see an, a print from his book that looks like a, you know, Gothic um, building, you know, you see the pointed arches and, the, um, you know, the sort of rosette uh, decorative features and so forth. Um, because this was the last, to, to, according to him and according to early arts and crafts aficionados, the medieval era was the last era that, you know, people lived off the land. They, that, you know, the architecture was true to its, its functionality, um, almost like embracing that as later Sullivan would say, form ever follows function. They thought Gothic architecture was, was doing that. They thought it was true architectural expression of its form and, and, structure uh, and not sort of clad in neo-gothic neo or neo-renaissance neo-greek neo-roman you know you know facades and one of the first works of architecture to merge out of this philosophy is red house this is in bexley heath um kent which is just outside of uh, london uh in england um, for, it starts in 1859, finished 1860. Philip Webb is the architect, but really the designer here is the owner, William Morris. William Morris is, uh, if, if John Ruskin is kind of like the, the, you might almost call him the grandfather of the arts and crafts movement, William Morris is like the father. He's the one who really spreads it as a popular architectural and design style throughout England, and then that carries over later into America. He's very influential to American designers and thinkers as well in the arts and crafts movement. Um, he was a very, you know, came from a very prominent wealthy family, and he too uh, lamented the changes of the Industrial Revolution. And so he, he started um, publishing books by hand you know, not factory produced, mass produced books, you know, but handcrafted books, uh, the way they were used to, you know, uh, with, you know, fancy bindings and, you know, fancy paper and that sort of thing. Obviously don't sell many of those. You can't mass produce them, but you can sell them for a very expensive price. And he did wallpaper, very famous for his wallpaper and uh, for other design elements that um, he could produce. The irony of the arts and crafts movement is that it was quite elitist, right? Because if you're working in a factory, uh, you can you you know you you can only afford to buy factory produced items that are cheap and easily to buy. Same thing today. People go to Walmart and uh, dollar stores because you know that's all they can afford. And you know, you know, if you're <laughs> you can't afford to buy a handcrafted book, you can't afford to hand, buy handcrafted wallpaper and stuff like that, um, unless you're rather wealthy or at least upper middle class. And so the arts and craft movement tended to be something that appealed to wealthy people, to you know upper middle class when we talk about American architecture and Frank Lloyd Wright and so forth. It did not filter down all that much into the sort of working classes in America. This is um, one of those books that he printed, a handcrafted book, uh, Kelmscott Manor. Uh, and he talks about a house a house, you know, set in nature, set in a garden, you know, uh, and not designed here by a grand office architect, but that emerges over time uh, by the people living in it. If they need a wing added on for a kitchen, then they build on a kitchen wing. Need um, a, a second floor, they build a second floor. This is the way houses were built and and uh, expanded in you know, for, for time immemorial and during the medieval age. And that's how he thought a house, a real house ought to be built. Um, ironically, again, something like Red House that I'll show you in a moment is built, you know, designed and built as a single entity, right? But it's built and designed to look like it evolved in this garden landscape over many, many decades. Um, that's, the, that's the other great irony of the arts and crafts movement. It It's romanticizing this, um, this, um, way of building, way of designing that might have occurred decades and centuries ago, but then they're doing it, you know, as one entity uh, right away. This is some of the wallpaper that he designed. You can still buy William Morris wallpaper reproductions and put them in your house if you want to. All right, so here's Red House. Um, and this 
has a medieval look to it. You know, it, it has pointed arches, tall, narrow windows, you know, lots of chimneys and tall peaked roofs, very much a medieval looking house because that's what was romanticized. That good architecture uh, dates back to this medieval era. And it looks like it's rambling. It's not symmetrical. It's not a, a box with a cladding of Greek columns and Roman arches and so forth. Um, this really eschews that, you know, classical architecture that was still very popular in the 19th century. We've talked about all of it, you know, in, in previous lectures. So this is a fundamental, this is a radical shift in architecture that begins um, here at Red House, uh, uh, essentially. Here's the floor plan. On the left is the ground floor. The entrance is up here at the top. And you enter into a hall. And just like in a medieval castle or a medieval building, you'd have this great hall with a giant walk-in fireplace. And that's where the family gathered and so forth. Um, they they kind of recreate that here at Red House with this hall here. It's much bigger than you need for an entrance hall and stairway. Uh, there's still some grand dining rooms and drawing rooms. I'll show you a couple images. Um, but then um, it has, you know, smaller rooms off to the edges, off in this meandering house kitchens and uh, bedrooms and so forth, you know, servant spaces and, and all that. And it actually centers on the back around a little courtyard with a well, very charming little well here. Uh, here's, the, here's the view of the back of the house. This is even more famous than the front view. And there's the well. Um, you know, by this time, you're probably still getting water out of a well, but, you know, it's made to look like this wonderful timbered well with a with a tile roof over it. Um, certainly fancier than than most people got well. Um, and you see, again, you know, pointed arches, narrow windows with little panes of glass, uh, roofs, you know, with, you know, lots of lots of um, gables and dormers and and. Uh, and chimneys on it uh, that looks like it just grew and expanded over time as it, as the family spread out over many many decades and generations. But again, it's all built at once, right? It's it's meant to look like that romanticized idea, but it's all built at one time to to sort of evoke that that natural organic expansion of a of a house over many generations. And if we even look at the brick. The brick is not factory produced, you know, really clean cut, smooth faced brick that could be bought uh, in this era. It is uh, a, a, almost a hand pressed style brick. Um, and, you know, later technologies would exist to make brick look hand pressed and be factory made. Uh, this was probably hand pressed brick at this time. But um, the idea, again, is to, to make it look like it was built by hand, by craftsmen, not by a machine, not by factory produced elements. Here we see a couple more just details and images from the house. So here's the interior. Uh, this is that great hall. It's a big open space with a huge, uh, you know, wood, oversized piece of furniture. Uh, we see a lot of natural woodwork. This is something that emerges in the arts and crafts movement is the idea of instead of, you know, framing doors and windows and staircases and then painting it all, which was the common way of doing things, um, you take really nice wood, mahogany or cherry or something, and you leave it exposed. You stain it, you varnish it, and you let the beauty of the wood grain, you know, be on display. This was something that came out of the arts and crafts movement. It had never really been done before. Wood was always painted uh, because it was, you know, you usually just use cheaper wood, um, you know, pine or something like that. And you just, pine doesn't look that good when it's just left exposed. Here's the front door. Uh, it has iron hinges and straps like, a, you know, handcrafted, hand forged ironwork uh, from the medieval age. And then it has even a little art glass, leaded art glass windows in here, uh, which is, you know, you think of art glass in Gothic cathedrals. Um, they're going to they're going to do a lot of that in these arts and crafts houses here. This is the upper part of the stair. You can see more of that beautiful woodwork of the stair. And this is the drawing room upstairs. This is a big room where the family could gather together. And this is one of those, what I call a, a walk-in fireplace, right? It's massive, giant fireplace. Look over here underneath this big cupboard. That's a radiator. 
Radiators they did by the mid 1800s. You'd have a boiler, coal-fired boiler, and you could heat your house with a with a radiator. You didn't need giant fireplaces like we saw in the colonial salt box houses or whatever we talked about recently. Uh, but this was the part of the romantic view that you needed a giant fireplace because that's where the family gathered. The, the heat from the fire provided the warmth to the family. Frank Lloyd Wright would call the fireplace the hearth was the heart of the home. Uh, and he put a fireplace in every room, even though, again, you, you didn't need fireplaces. You didn't cook over an open fire like they did in medieval ages, and you didn't need them for heat. Um, but you put them in because that was a symbolic warmth, uh, the symbolic hearth that tied back to that simpler era before the Industrial Revolution. Here's some of the art glass window, hand-painted glass put into leaded frames. Uh, don't, you know, we don't build windows like this, even by the 1850s. Um, they, they were building, you know, factory produced wood sashes with larger panes of glass. Uh, this, is, this is trying to recreate a, a handcrafted something from a simpler time. And it was also an art movement. Um, and here we see a quote by Oscar Wilde um, uh, from 1882. So a little later, it, the, the, the movement evolves, you know, it, it doesn't stay static. And uh, in this quote by Oscar Wilde, um, he says, do we object to machinery? Um, no, uh, machines have a place. Um, uh, and, and its place is when it relieves man from ignoble and soulless labor, not when it seeks to do which is valuable, only when wrought by the hands and hearts of men. So um, as the movement progresses, you know, they realize pretty quickly that the industrial revolution is not going anywhere. You know, it's advancing and more and more things are made by hand. Uh, you know, they, they begin to say, okay, there are, you know, trains and railroads are, are a good thing, right? They allow us to move about, you know, much easier than horse and buggy, much faster too. Um, and, you know, a, a, a steam engine uh, ball bearings should be made in a factory. That makes sense. But something that goes in the home, that is something that, you know, really ought to be crafted from the human hand with the, with the soul and the energy that is put in the spirit of something that is handcrafted, we shouldn't lose that. So this represents an evolution, and we'll see a later evolution even when we get to Frank Lloyd Wright, a more embracing of technologies and factory production, but to create something that still has artistic value um, uh, when we get to Frank Lloyd Wright. And here's some of the art movement um, that is occurring. This is known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Um, and these are a series of artists, mostly English, that um, create art that is pre-Raphael, pre-Renaissance, you know, we talked about Raphael and Michelangelo, those great Renaissance artists uh, that are turning towards, you know, the classics of antiquity, of Greece and Rome, and, you know, using perspective that Brunelleschi had developed um, to, to create more realistic images. Um, the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood looked to medieval themes, looked to nature as their inspiration, and were not too concerned about, you know, perfect you know, symmetry and perfect perspective. Even in this image here, um, there the perspective is not quite pure and perfect the way Brunelleschi would have done. And of course, they look like they they walked right out of a medieval landscape here. Uh, this next one is um, they they were inspired by you know um, mythological stories uh, of ancient Greece. This is Hylas and the Nymphs was a uh, mythological story. Hylas was um, sent to fetch water um, in this pond, and, and he <laughs> walks upon. He discovers all these, you know, little nymphs in the water who who seduce him, right? And they draw him in, and you know, he disappears. He never comes back with the water, and his his party is like, what what happened to Hylas? Where did he go? Um, and so this is. Um, very much nature inspired, of course. It's a naturalist setting, like the um, like the arts and crafts movement uh, issues. But it also has this 
this you know moralistic theme here to it right to that is part of the arts and crafts movement uh don't be seduced you know and and drawn away from your work you know from your mission and your you know what you need to be doing um the way these nymphs you know seduce hylas away from, from what he was supposed to be doing fetching water uh, here's another great example. Dante Gabriel Rossetti was probably the, the, the greatest master of uh, the Pre-Raphaelites. Uh, he was a good friend of William Morris. Uh, here in Lady Lil Lilith, we see um, she's surrounded by nature, you know, flowers and plants, even in the little vase down here in the bottom right. There's even a window with a view out to nature beyond. Um, this is really showing how the arts and crafts artists and the philosophers are tying the importance of nature um, is, is really on display here. And then one more um, by Rossetti, uh, the salutation of Beatrice. And so uh, one little aside, by the way, uh, Rossetti was very good friends with William Morris and his family. Uh, and <laughs> so good <laughs> that he wound up having an affair <laughs> with <laughs> William Morris's wife. And uh, that sort of split up the relationship there, I think, in the end. All right, so uh, we'll leave uh, we'll leave uh, on that note uh, for the day. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other arts and crafts, our artists, our architects in England, and we'll talk about how it moves to America in the uh, late 19th century.